Oh, yeah. We yeah, I think every kid loves a horse at some point. Yeah. You know, right. some of us go horse crazy, yeah. <laughs> others don't. But uh, I enjoy showing them off. Of course, I, I raised them, so I'm proud of them. Right, but, yeah, of course. Uh, Do you participate in the uh, spring farm days deal where uh, draft horses or. Uh, plowing and I have done demonstrations those like that. Uh, occasionally. Uh, most of those are in the eastern part of the state, so I'm far enough west it's a big trip to go. So I haven't participated as much as I would like okay. to. Okay, okay. I know Doc Jones has been organizing some of that yeah. in Colorado. And I know there's been some out toward his area, yeah. and I've stopped yeah. and talked to him before. Okay. So. Uh, All right, thank you. I, I, I'm just in a bad location. I'm out in the middle of nowhere. Okay. <laughs> Good morning. These are Belgian Perch and Cross. Both of those are draft breeds that were developed in Europe and then shipped to the U.S. back in the 1700s. They started importing or even maybe later 1600s. Uh, the Belgian and the Perchern are the two most numerous draft breeds even today as they were back in the frontier days, they were the most popular, uh, probably mostly because they were the most numerous and were shipped overseas in the greatest numbers. Uh, they used to import hundreds from Europe until the breeding uh, farms here in the U.S. got established and they started raising more locally. Uh, the uh, Belgians are usually a sorrel, which is a, a light red, and they go to blonde manes, uh, white feet. The Percheron originally are, were usually blacks and grays, and then they started being more roans, and uh, occasionally a few bays, and a bay horse has a brown body with black points, like the black legs and black mane and tail. It's what you call a bay. Uh, so. So the roan was something that they developed later on and became popular. And uh, I've just always been partial to grays and roans. And so as I've raised colts, those are the ones I keep back. The, the bay colts or brown colts that are born, I've been selling those off. So now out of the five draft mares I've got, most of them uh, throw uh, a roan, either a bay roan or the blue roan like this. The bay roan has the black legs uh, like, and black face like this blue roan, only the body has, has the red hair with the white instead of the black hair uh, to make this blue roan, they call those the bay roan. So I've got two mares that are over in the arena. They are both bay roans. Uh, one of them has a colt and he's a blue roan. Uh, the stud I've got is a blue roan, like this mare in gilding. And this mare is bred. She will have a foal to that blue roan in uh, June. So she's three months along. Horses carry a foal 11 months. Uh, right now, her foal is about the size of a cantaloupe. Uh, we sonogrammed her at two weeks. And at that point, that foal was about as big as my thumbnail. But three months down the line, he's about cantaloupe size now. Uh, we can sonogram them. Unlike people, there's so much volume in there, they can't tell sex on those, those colts, but they can confirm pregnancies, and that's what I go for. Another reason we, we preg check is in case there is twins. For some reason, horses hardly ever raise a set of twins. Occasionally they can, but normally they will abort. Uh, last two years ago, I got busy and didn't take them down to get uh, preg checked, and I had one had twins. And worst case scenario happened, one of those embryos died early, and she carried this mummified fetus until the other colt was within a month of being full term, and she aborted both of them, so I lost both. So that was just a good lesson to me. No matter how busy I am, I take them down and get them preg checked. Early on, when those, when those 
eggs are small, like the size of your thumbnail, if they find a set of twins, they will break one of those eggs. And it doesn't hurt them, they'll just absorb that, that fluid from that broken egg, but that will lay it, let her raise one good healthy colt. And uh, it's just too much of a gamble to let one try to raise uh, a set of twins. The odds are against you raising a pair of twins. Like I say, it, it can happen occasionally, but it's rare. Um, let's see, did I tell you how old they were? No, no. She is 18 and he is 16. They are brother and sister. Uh, she weighs 1,925 pounds, so she's just 75 pounds short of weighing a ton. He's just about 50 pounds lighter. He's close, but a little smaller. She is a little taller, uh, and that's just uh, the difference in size, just like you and your brother or your sister, your different sizes. Uh, I try to, when I hook them up, I try to pick two that are the same size. I don't care if they're related or not, as long as they're the same size. Yes. Um, uh, who's the father of that I have a blue roan. Uh, he's a hundred percent Percheron, which is the French breed. He's a hundred percent Perch, but he's blue roan like this, and he is the sire of this baby that she's carrying. And and this new this year. He had his third crop. He's still down. He's just five years old. And so his third crop of colts were born last June. So this will be his fourth crop of colts coming up. I've got five mares and and uh, they're all bred to the same sire. Yes, ma'am. What are your names? Names? Yeah, this one. This one's Kate. And his name is Lippy. <laughs> When he was a colt and I took him to bed and they were gonna castrate him or neuter him, whichever you're familiar with, when they gave him the shot to put him asleep, his face hit the ground real hard and it damaged a nerve across his face. And so for about two months, he walked around with his bottom lip hanging. You think he'd had a stroke or something. So anyway, because of that bottom lip flopping, he was a sloppy eater with that lip and everything, but they guaranteed me it would heal, and, and he has. It doesn't bother him now, you can't even tell it. But because of that floppy lip, I named him Lippy, and it just stuck. And one guy reminded me, have you ever seen the movie Lonesome Dove? Yeah, I have. The old piano player's name was Lippy. I don't know how he got the name, but one guy thought I named him after the piano player on Lonesome Dove, so go figure. I guess that name's been around longer than I realized. Anyway, uh, these are called blinders that they put on the, the bridle. They use them on work horses and carriage horses to keep them focused on what they're doing. They're going down the street or following the furrow in the field, they want them focused on their job and not paying attention to what's going on around them, especially carriage horses or when these horses were in town going up and down the street, a uh, flag flying or a women's dress flopping in the wind. They didn't want anything on the side bothering them, so they started using these blinders on them, keep them focused on their job. It just kind of helped keep everybody doing what they're supposed to do and not distracted and, and causing them getting scared and making runaway. This is a collar, it goes around their neck, just like the collar of your shirt goes around your neck. Uh, this is called a hane. It's what locks the load into that collar. And then this is called the tug, and it goes back. There's one on each side, and this, this would hook to the load, and all they have to do is lean into that collar and they can move the load. Whether it be dragging logs, pulling a plow, or pulling the wagon. This is the britching. They call, that's the brake. See that comes up, uh, a strap on each side, goes between their front leg up to here. And this would hook to the front piece across the end of the wagon. And all they have to do is set back and their butt hits that strap and that stops the wagon. So that's kind of the basics. Uh, the lines split, so the right lane, right line or rein goes to the right side on both horses. 
it splits. The left one splits and goes to the left side on both of them. So I'm driving back here with just two lines, but yet I'm uh, guiding both sides. Okay. Thanks for listening.